This video is part of CAE Associates' ANSYS eLearning series. CAE Associates is an engineering consulting firm in Middlebury, Connecticut, specializing in finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics. We have been an ANSYS channel partner since 1985 and have developed our ANSYS eLearning series to help you maximize your software investment. Please visit our website, which includes an extensive resource library with over 250 items and counting in an easily searchable area. We also invite you to visit our Engineering Advantage blog, where we share insights from our many years of performing engineering analysis. CAE Associates also offers an extensive schedule of ANSYS courses taught at our Millbury office. If you need help deciding on the best courses to take for your application, visit our CAE University page. The complete library of e-learning recordings is available for viewing in our resource library and also on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C-A-E-A-I. So the topics for today are, do we take full advantage of all the different boundary conditions available to us in terms of building our model, supplying our different connection supports, and do we understand the ramifications of those supports and connections? So we're going to talk a little bit about evaluating boundary conditions, provide some simple examples. Uh, including in those boundary conditions, we'll be utilizing uh, boundary conditions such as remote supports, symmetry, anti-symmetry, periodic, cyclic symmetry. Some other features that have recently been added in terms of capabilities of applying nodal displacements or nodal boundary conditions where the region of load does not have to align itself with the geometry. And then also some advanced connection features, in particular, some of the capabilities in terms of defining joints in your model. So as a demonstration, as an example, what I've put together is just take a simple beam. And when this is a beam uh, resting on a couple columns. And interesting that when I first started doing finite elements some 30 years ago, this was the first problem given to me was here, create a finite element model and give me results that match beam theory. And 30 years later, we're still uh, an issue in terms of building correct and adequate boundary conditions to solve a particular problem of interest. So there's many different ways, of course, to model the condition of a beam sitting on a couple columns. And what I want to go over is some different techniques and see the ramifications of the different methods and different boundary conditions that can be employed. So the simplest method we can employ to define this is to simply build the actual beam. In this case, the beam only where the column constraints are neglected from the model and we have two different support conditions. In the beam model, um, the finite element uh, brick mesh, there's a fixed support defined where we fix the entire end of the beam, or a frictionless support and then a the vertical constraint is only applied on the edge of the model. For the beam only model, we're applying a fixed constraint at both ends of the beam and then a pin constraint on both ends. And we can use symmetry and model half the beam, of course, uh, as needed. And if we compare the ramifications of these two different modeling techniques, we expose something that's of interest to every user is, do my boundary conditions, are they influencing my results? And for the condition of stress results, the stress is at the edge of the beam where we have a fixed constraint, uh, creates a singularity. So those stresses in the brick model are not analysis stresses that we would use in any kind of design ramifications. They're really just for reference only condition. And as you notice, for the two different conditions, as I refine the mesh, the stress increases, uh, also exemplifying the fact that it's a singularity. For the beam only model, I can model the fixed constraint and the pin constraint. And these two boundary conditions typically will bound the solution of any type of result or any type of modeling simulation. So you notice for the beam only model, my minimum, the displacement for the fixed condition is 0.029, which is similar to what I'm getting for the brick model. And then if I use a pin-pin connection, I get significantly more displacement, 
0.14 essentially uh, inches of displacement. So these give me two bounding solutions, but this might necessarily and probably isn't going to be accurate enough for what I need for my particular design evaluation. So to increase the accuracy, I need to extend, or one of the ways to increase is extend the model a little out farther out into the actual physical geometry. And one of the options for doing that is using what's called a remote point. And as part of that remote point, I can put a remote connection. So I'm going to tie, in this case, the top of the column to the beam. But I'm not going to actually model this in depth in finite elements at this point. But I'm simply going to make a connection between the two. And I can use the remote point feature. And as the remote portrait feature in terms of defining this, I have several different options in terms of how I can characterize the behavior between the surface at the top of the column and the connection point, which is where I am assuming that there's some kind of rigid support of my column. Maybe it's uh, attached to ground, for instance. And you can see in the rope point pull down is that we have four different options. We have a rigid, deformable, beta, uh, beam connection, and a so-called coupled connection. And to get an understanding of the differences of these two different these methods in terms of applying this type of constraint, we notice that for the rigid connection, uh, the connection and the geometry will stay constant at the top of the column. For if we have a force-based condition, we can get deformation that could occur at the top of the column. So the column surface is no longer rigid. And this is demonstrated in these images showing that the deformed or force-based constraint allows for local deformation. The rigid constraint keeps the original geometry. The coupled constraint would allow us to determine which particular degrees of freedom we want to transfer this load from the point to this surface. The beam method, it turns out, that internally what ANSYS will do is create a whole series of linked beam elements. And these beam elements are connected between the nodes at the top of the column to the support condition. And the cross-sectional area of these beams is set equal to approximately the nodal surface area for our particular model that we're analyzing. And if we take now and compare the results in terms of now we're looking at going to look at just the mid-span stress results to get away from the singularity at the column beam connection, and compare the results with the beam-only model, whether the beam-only model is modeled with brick elements or modeled with beam elements, and compare that with the remote point. And you notice that the remote point gives us more flexibility. The displacements increase. Um, from roughly 0.03 to 0.04. And there's a variation between the stiffness characterization. You know, it's the most flexible connection of these is the remote beam option, where we now have some flexibility defined between our fixed constraint and the top of our column. And we can also look at this particular example on the options in terms of looking at the how it's set up within the ANSYS workbench environment. So we would insert a remote point into our project tree. And in the details pane of the remote point, we can select the particular surfaces that we want to be connected. And then we can also select the behavior of how we're going to connect this option, whether we use the rigid, deformable, coupled. And also, if we choose, we can specify or isolate manually which particular degrees of freedom we want active in that particular connection. So using the remote point gives us a more accurate solution, but it, we're still not really characterizing the stiffness of the column explicitly. So the next point, the next level of fidelity in terms of increasing the accuracy of our solution we'll be go ahead and model the column explicitly. Now, to save in computational effort, we may not necessarily want to model the entire column section. So what I've shown here demonstrating is we can take the column and split it into two components, where the upper portion of the column, where it connects to the beam, is modeled explicitly with detailed finite elements. 
and the lower portion of the column is modeled with beam elements. So we simplify the computational effort. And along that interface, we can tie those two surfaces together using a contact where we're going to use a vertex to target uh, type contact, a bonded condition, where now we're going to use the MPC option, which is going to write constraint equations to take the rotational degrees of freedom on the top of the beam and translate that stiffness across to the translational degrees of freedom at the top of the column. So we get a continuous displacement response uh, and through the column, so we're representing the true stiffness of the column itself. The other thing you can do is now there can be a connection between the top of the column and the beam. And for this example, I looked at two different scenarios. The first scenario says, what if I simply totally bond the top of the column to the beam? And the second scenario was, what if I take the beam and assume it's just resting on the column, but it's a frictionless support, so it's just a beam sitting on the column. And if I compare and contrast the analysis results for these two scenarios, you notice that for the option of the bonded connection, that the displacement response and stress response, it's a little underestimated, but it's a reasonable approximation to this scenario would be this remote point with the beam feature. If I take the scenario of a frictionless connection between the top of my column and the support, in this scenario, it's more of analogous to just a pinned beam scenario. So my pinned beam model actually fairly accurately represents the mid-span axial stress and mid-span displacements that occur with this kind of modeling assumption. And we can look at the modeling setup for this particular scenario in the actual mechanical setup. So under our contacts, we can specify a bonded connection. And the bonded connection can be defined between the vertex of the beam element and the two faces of the column become the target. And for this scenario, we're using a bonded contact. And in the formulation here, using the MPC formulation, we can use this option to translate the rotational degrees of freedom that are going to be coupled between the rotational degrees of freedom at the top of the beam to the translational degrees of freedom at the base of the column section modeled. So a little bit of insight in a simple example, but help to illustrate some methods that may be incorporated to make your boundary conditions to understand and interpret the results of them, and maybe potentially may improve the results of your analysis. So what I'm going to do next is talk about symmetry. But before I get into the details of symmetry, I'm going to open the first poll and just get an idea of what people use in terms of symmetry in their particular analysis. So we're looking at reflective symmetry, anti-symmetry, which is illustrated on the slide, cyclic symmetry, and periodic symmetry. So I'll leave a couple minutes for people to fill in the poll. And then, of course, what's of interest of these is you can see what your colleagues uh, answered in terms of what types of boundary conditions that they typically use most often for symmetry type conditions. I'll give this a couple more seconds. Uh, the example here shown here is showing that the symmetry condition, which is used by a lot of people, and then the anti-symmetry condition, which may not be used as often. Uh, one of the things to be careful about is the symmetric boundary condition works whether we're doing a linear or nonlinear analysis, whereas the anti-symmetry boundary condition, strictly speaking, is only for principles of superposition. It only really applies to small deflection type problems. But we can have, of course, potentially uh, conditions even with uh, material and large deflection geometry and higher order kind of issues where the anti-symmetry boundary can be a reasonable approximation. So I'll go ahead and close the poll. And at this time, and then I'll show the poll results to everybody. <clears throat> 
And basically, it's split between people using reflective symmetry and cyclic symmetry. Go ahead and save my results real quick. So which brings me to the reflective symmetry and what we're going to cover here, and we'll go through the various different types of symmetry boundary conditions we're going to apply. Symmetry boundary condition may be something that most people are already aware of, but anti-symmetry and the superposition of symmetry and anti-symmetry is something that can be useful for certain types of problems. So let's say we took the example here where the problem we're trying to solve is a, comp a condition where the loading condition is a asymmetric type loading, where I'm just putting pressure load on one side of my beam. But from a computational expense, I can get away with only modeling half the beam column connection and still be able to represent this non-symmetric loading by using principles of superposition and using a combination of symmetric and anti-symmetric boundary conditions. In this example below here, I modeled the entire beam column connection with this eccentric load. And then I'm show where you can go through and model only one half and apply the appropriate boundary conditions. So for example, I can set up a mechanical session where I specify my boundary conditions being a pressure load on the surface of my beam and a symmetry boundary condition where I'm only constraining in the direction of the axial component or an anti-symmetry boundary condition where my displacement constraints are the two in-plane directions. And now I can combine these results using a design assessment tool. So drag and drop the design assessment tool on top of these mechanical setup. And in the design assessment tool, I can then define scaling factors for prescribing my superposition. So if I take the example model here, I have set up a model, a single model with, with symmetry boundary conditions. In this case, I'm modeling a symmetry plane uh, if along, it's only off modeling half the beam uh, in its the horizontal dimension. I've set up the various conditions and the beam column connection and contact connections between, in this case, a bonded connection between the beam and the column. And for the prescribed boundary conditions now, I can set up the boundary conditions as a displacement condition in the solution. And the reason I did that is because now I can have only over one tree, I can have the anti-symmetric results. And in the same multiple, multiple system mechanical project, I can also have the symmetric boundary condition where I'm only constraining normal to the surface and I can have the symmetric response. And with the inserted design assessment tool on my project page, where I have design assessment that was dragged and dropped on top of the two static structurals, then within my tree structure, I can actually define, prescribe a load combination. And if I'm just going to use superposition of these two static loads, I can simply just say I'm going to use a static loading on these two cases with a 0.5 multiplier to get the effects of the combined results. And now when I plot results, now I have results of the combined symmetric plus anti-symmetric solution. Other types of symmetry we can look at, we can look at periodic symmetry. Uh, they can be periodic in terms of along a line, or they can be periodic in terms of cyclic symmetry. Uh, cyclic symmetry, I won't get into too much detail here because we could do an entire session on cyclic symmetry and the various different options of that if that's of interest in the future. So if I touch on periodic symmetry, and this is a new feature added in 14.5, and I say I have a circuit board and a repetitive pattern in terms of the circuits define the chips and uh, isolators on this board, and I model the entire board, and I have to have some kind of boundary conditions and constraints, but if I have a, psych or a repetitive symmetric structure, 
And the loading is also repetitive symmetric. For instance, in this case, a lateral acceleration load is that you notice in my analysis of the full structure, not exactly periodic, but very close to being periodic is the results of the analysis of the full structure. So as a simplification, that's something I can do design studies on. Rather than analyzing the full circuit board, I'm going to take out the smallest repeatable segment so now my analytical model is significantly smaller, and I can add two different boundary conditions where I can use a symmetry boundary condition along the center symmetry plane, and then a, another symmetry condition, which would be a linear periodic symmetry condition, to define coupling equations that would tie the two front and back face of my circuit board. And I also need to specify the shift, or what's the delta dimension between there. And Workbench will automatically create the appropriate coupling equations. And now I can run this analysis totally independent as a local model, but representing the full structure, assuming a periodic symmetric response. And if I look at the, in the post process, I can expand the solution so that I show that I'm getting this periodic response and things make physical sense in terms of prescribing the periodic boundary conditions correctly. And if I look at nominal stress results in the board itself, I see very good comparison between the periodic model and the full circuit board example. Another example of periodic symmetry is cyclic symmetry. So in cyclic symmetry, I'm going to cut out the smallest repeatable segment where this segment is going to be a ratio of 360, so it's going to be a portion of my entire model. I specify a high and low boundary conditions for now. In this case, if it's a modal cyclic symmetry, ANSYS will build constraint equations between the lower and higher face of the real part and lower and higher face of the imaginary part. And in the analysis phase, I can specify which particular harmonic index I want ANSYS to calculate. And this is just showing an example of setting up a model for the harmonic response of setting up a model for a cyclic symmetry. The next boundary condition I want to talk about is a condition where I want to prescribe either loads or constraints, but I don't necessarily have geometry that matches up with the group of nodes I want to apply this load to. In this case, I can use a condition in mechanical, which is called nodal-based constraints. So you can set up name selections based on really a series of selections or isolations of a group of nodes in your model. And these are analogous to running, for those that are you use uh, mechanical APDL or ANSYS Classic on a regular basis, analogous to a series of node select um, commands, where we can select from the full group, and then we can take a filter or take subsets of our group of nodes that we've created. And a couple different examples here showing where I can isolate local sets of nodes. And these options can be set up such that they're in your mechanical outline tree, such that if I make changes to geometry, loads, et cetera, they automatically, any changes will update. So I can run these in parametric studies or design optimization operations. And just as an example, just showing, demonstrating that I've applied that pressure load to that pattern, if I look at the stress normal to that particular area, I match the 1,000 PSI pressure that I defined. And so I'm going to pull up my particular example for this operation. So I have an example here where we can go ahead and specify, as part of our loading condition, a name selection where we can set, specify a name selection and we can specify a filter operation that selects the nodes based on a local coordinate system or based on the global coordinate system in this case. And if I want to change these parameters, I can change which particular groups. In this case, I'm filtering and isolating the nodes in the bottom 4 inch by 4 inch uh, base of the end of my beam. If I change this to an 8 by 8 segment and say generate, it updates the selection process automatically 
So now I have a larger section of constraint nodes. And I can go through and simply resolve my beam now with these updated conditions. So now I'm going to get the results of the cantilever beam with the full 8 by 8 support. And I can look at, here's the condition where my pressure load was applied here. My constraint is down there. And I can look at the reaction force, for example, being balanced. I can look at the stresses conditions. Now, another new feature that's been added, um, this one in 14.5, is the option that oftentimes I don't necessarily want to look at the reactions at the connections, but I sometimes want to be able to take a force balance anywhere on the interior of my model. And to provide that functionality, we can now use the options under the construction geometry where I can create a surface body, so a surface, in the surface geometry tool, and I can use this surface as part of my post-processing. So in the post-processing, I can specify a force reaction, only in this case now my force reaction can be based on a method of the surface method, so I can use it from the surface I'm defining with construction geometry. And so in this particular section, I can orient based on the section cut, so I can prescribe and calculate what the net reaction force or what the next force is at this section. And I can also take at this section and calculate the moment reaction. So I can take, in this case, it would be different moment reactions through the section. And I can specify the convention in terms of whether it's looking at the net moment based on the positive or negative side relative to my beam relative to this cut section. So those are a couple options in terms of setting up our nodal constraints and uh, post-processing them. The final topic of uh, today's webinar is, is going to be looking at some examples in terms of various different advanced connections. So if you look under the connection tree, there's a series of different options. In addition to contact, we can set up various different types of joints and springs and beams in our model. If we look at the joint and isolate that and look at that a little further, we notice that under joint, there's a series of different joint connections that we can create. And these could be between two bodies, or they can be between your body and ground. And if I look at these different variations, they can include different things from slot to uh, spherical connections, et cetera. And most of these, what these are developing uh, underneath in the actual analytical model is a series of multi-point constraint elements. So the documentation on the MPC-184 and the various different operations of that can be used to get more information on the series of different capabilities. And I have a single example that I want to demonstrate as a representation of this. In this case, what I've done is put in a translational joint. And I've tied the translational joint from a joint to joint ground to, to solid, and I've tied it to the end source of my beam. And so what ANSYS does internally is creates a pilot node that ties this point to the surface, and it connects the pilot node to an MPC-184 element. So in this particular example, I used a translational method. So the highlighted in the translational ground to solve, the red is the act of degrees of freedom. So in this case, the act of degree of freedom is translation in the horizontal direction. And there's all kinds of different options that we have available to us. So I'll go ahead and open the last poll, which is which boundary condition covered is something that you might see as a option that you may utilize in the future. Um, and then we'll get an idea of, of, of what everybody's answers are on that. So is it something we might use the remote, some of the remote point features, uh, some of the joint connections, uh, or maybe the, the uh, nodal-based constraints that we just showed? I'll give a couple more seconds to end the poll. Um, but at this time, I'd like to thank you for attending the latest in the series of CAE uh, uh, e-learning webinars, and uh, I know we have some exciting new topics coming up. Uh, one more seminar in terms of simplifying model generation, and then we're going to continue the series next year.
So let's look at the close the poll and look at the uh, solution results. And we notice that um, from the behavior of most people, joints is actually of big interest and nodal base constraints. So those two features of, of interest, and hopefully you'll try some of those out in the future. I want to thank you again and have a great rest of the day.